actually that's pleasure on my side that I got this opportunity to present our actual development on efforts to digitalize scientific workflows. So this time it's a slightly different style of presentation because I will not talk almost at all about directors. Of course, the outcomes from Bioreactors will be used in the presentation, but I am not talking about details, engineering, and so on, because I expect actually that all the attendants already know something about Bioreactors. If they are interested in details, then there are other sources. So I won't spend time on Bioreactors, even so we heavily use them and we are happy with them. From the distance, actually, now I read the title of my talk, which is Digital Platform for Intelligent Research on Microalgae. And I found out that it might sound a little bit offensive. And my message was not that other people are not doing intelligent research, <laughs> but I wanted to implement in the title that I will be talking also about artificial intelligence. So please don't feel offended by the title of the work. <laughs> Good. Talking about digitalization of your work, it's always very much related to fair principles. I'm sure all of you are aware of fair principles and what they are about, but I want to make only several highlights which are related to this work and to the presentation. So the important thing is that what we develop and what we try to do is for enhancement of the ability of machines to basically automatically process the data you are generating, right? And also the important thing is that the principles, like the fair principles, don't only apply on data itself, but also on whatever other available metadata, which means also algorithms, tools, overall workflows, or whatever can be digitalized, we should use the fair principles. So it means it should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And at the same time, there is many workflows nowadays that can work with digital information from large scale data, especially for omics. There are plenty of databases for proteomics, genomics, and so on, but there is only limited amount of resources or tools where you can properly handle traditional lab scale data, where you measure whatever chlorophyll content, write it into the table and then send it to whatever data files and so on. So our goal and wish was actually to develop a tool that can combine all these things, like large scale data, small scale data, and work with them in robust and modern way. So straightly jump to the stuff. So what we mean by digital platform, because now I'm not using the pointer, so I will describe it by words. So from the left side here, you see the architecture of the platform we developed by acronym, what we call it Optimalga which is a shortcut of two words like optimal alga. So obviously the original intention of this digital platform was to allow people and us as well to efficiently optimize LG, which means productivity of LG in principle. So from the left side, you can see that there is some input units, which you can imagine as a bioreactors, which goes into some data pipeline, which we develop with local check based company data friends. And this pipeline cares about data quality, so identification of outliers and so on, data retention, how the data are changed, the history of the data and data continuity, how the structure of the data is preserved over time if you add new and new data over time. Everything is stored in central database, so this is nothing really new. You have several solutions already available worldwide, even proprietary or open source. But what we develop further is sort of secured layer, which allows you to connect to this digital platform via web interface. So typical web interface you put into your web browser, www something, and you access the platform and can work with the data. You can manage them, you can share them, you can apply some analysis. Another thing which is quite unique and important for proper data management is that we implemented bi-directional communication with the input units. So meaning by rectors or other cultivators. So via web interface, you can also control them. You can give them the commands, which is very important for efficient work and efficient data management. So I will focus for a short time on this part because this is a very tricky thing since connecting or linking to devices like Bioreactors is usually not simply possible because the manufacturers that doesn't provide you communication protocols directly. So we develop another layer, which is like developing control unit, where we worked on a software solution that allows you to connect to a wide range of scientific instruments, including sensors and so on. So on the right side, now you can see many of the web page and I put it here only to make visual link and connection to the following slide. So this is not now related to this slide only to make it clear for the future. 
And here you already can see that we have devices, which means you can really go to devices and control. So back to the control units. This is schematically what basically I mean by solution for universal communication with other devices. So we developed the stuff which is in the middle, so it's small box on the next side. I will describe some technical details, but the idea is basically to have universal plug and play solution for very robust data collection. So with, with this device, you should be able to plug it into Bioreact. Uh, you have from PSI, from other manufacturer, from your own workshop. You should be able to connect sensors in the best case, intelligence servers that provide also additional information. For example, implement also balances from metalateral data and so on. And the system is open access, so you can develop your own communication protocols and basically implement the devices. The system implements the REST API protocol. This is the term, so you need to understand it in detail, but basically it's standard communication for accessing web services. So this is the important thing because then you can connect to whatever web services, not only our optimal data solution. And the idea of to work not only with data, but to collect also protocols, calibration, and all the available metadata best in the machine generated way. So basically you don't need to care about all the important data, which are coming along the experimental work. Another example is that for plant people, we can connect also growth chambers. So the range of devices is very universal. Some technical details for those who are interested. These are the units, you can parallelize them, you can have many of them. They are relatively affordable depending on configuration, starting from 100 US dollars for one of them. You can connect many devices to one control unit, or you can have individual control unit for each device to make it more autonomous, let's say. This device is very small, like seven multiplied by nine and six centimeters. So it can really get into shelf and we have open source proprietary software solution that will allow you to program your devices and connect the instruments. So back to the digital platform, I mentioned like data managing. So if you want to manage the data, here is the example of the web interface. So you see list of some measurements. You can import your new data from typical tabular form. You can annotate all the data, meaning basically you can transform all your paper logs to digital form. If this has not been done automatically in a digitalization, of course you can download the data. So these are typical simple things. You can filter through the data. This is also nothing really new, but the, the nice thing is that these data you, you filter out, you can then select and put them in different contexts, meaning you can create new experiments or add them to existing experiments. So you can sort of lump, join or merge data from different sources and give them one common context. You can, of course, change permission to the data, which is very important to keep the data safe against, you know, unintentional changes and so on. So you can give the permission on the level of organization, groups, or even individuals. You can, of course, control write or read access. The important thing nowadays, especially, is, of course, sharing. So international collaborations. So one way to share your data is via email. So you can select the data you want to share, put the email of your colleague, and the colleague receives sort of invitation to the same platform. So he will see the same environment as you are working in and get the access to the data. Another important thing for data processing and automation is actually generation of API key or token, which is thing that is used by other applications than we develop, like for example, Python, MATLAB, R or Rust or Java, whatever you name. And in these environments, you can access the data that are on the server without any need for downloading and processing the data outside of your tool. With this tightly coupled is model. So here you see like model part where you can store scripts, mathematical models, operations, whatever. But I am now showing one script in MATLAB where you basically put this API key and then suddenly magic starts. So all the stuff like the statistical processing, cleaning of the data, detection of outliers and so on will happen on the real data on the server without you needing some manipulation with the data. And the outcome is in this case, like generation of nice figures. Obviously, the big advantage is if you work with live data, then next time you run the script or the model, basically all the data that are actual or updated on the server are automatically refreshed and you work always with the best data. The same applies, of course, if some of your colleagues is working on data, for example, removing the stuff which was identified as whatever contaminated culture or broken experiment. Then next time you get the proper data and someone else working on it and of course, leaving the information. behind. So now slightly more to scientific part. 
So we did large experiment on hydrogen producing cyanobacteria. In this case, it's in particular cyanotc51142. And what we wanted to do is to sort of generate very dense data for a combination of conditions or factors of the environment to not only understand the happening of the strain, but to generate enough data for development of AI model, right? So you need some data where you sort of develop, parameterize and benchmark your models. You don't want to do it on a real life experiment. And for this, we needed really huge amount of data that will cover basically, in this case, three factors, which is LED light, blue light, and temperature, and see how the cells are growing. So this simple scenario of biomass production. So there is a growth rate on the color scale where you can see the dark red is something like 7.5 hours doubling time and dark blue is 72. It's almost not growing at all. And with this experiment, we eventually spent almost three years of instrument accumulated time. So if we were running on six by rectus divided by six, so it's not really three years of student's life, but it's instrument time. But still, it's a huge amount of data, huge amount of media and so on. We tried to do all the combination in at least three biological replicates to really believe the data. This was actually quantified by statistical analysis, meaning that if three biological replicates were not enough statistically close together, we had to produce more data points to be sure that the data in combination of condition is valid. Because you can imagine that for whatever model or algorithm, it's really crucial to work with data you can trust. So like sort of ground through data. Now, if there is like large biological variability, you cannot continue with this development or parameterization of your model. And you can imagine this is only the beginning, right? Because if we have more factors, which I'm now coming to, then the combination are growing exponentially. So you can imagine we had temperature, red and blue light in decent regularity. So temperature was like six points, red light eight points, blue light five points, and suddenly we have 240 combinations. If you have biological replicates three, then you have 720 experiments. If you include cell density, nutrients, salinity, whatever, then suddenly you have 100,000 combinations and you cannot do it manually unless you spend lives on this. We were thinking how to do it more smart. There are ways, especially from chemical engineering, using response surface design. If you don't know this methodology, I strongly suggest to you to study it because it's a very universal way how to design your experiment. So we benchmark with this traditional, in chemistry at least, method, where the method basically predefines in which conditions you should do a limited number of experiments and then sort of extrapolate to a final solution. So the right graph only shows how the combinations are in y x plane. So they are nicely distributed in the center of the space of combinations on the borders and somewhere in between. And then you can sort of extrapolate how would be the optima without knowing the other information necessary. What was the outcome of this surface design methodology? We find out that it's not the worst result, but it's still far away from reality. But the good thing you need to approximately spend something like 360 hours doing the experiments to find the almost close optima. So this was enough compared to three years of experimentation. But the next step obvious was, especially obvious nowadays, is to try to use AI methods. And before I go to details about our results, I would like to spend short time on theory because nowadays everyone is talking about AI and usually it's basically deep learning or neural networks, but AI is pretty broad term and there is many other algorithms and methods involved in AI. And in our case, especially, we will be talking about evolutionary algorithms. These are algorithms that were specifically designed for optimization of complex systems or complex problems. And they are in most cases inspired by nature. So it's why it's called evolutionary because they sort of get inspiration by nature, how it evolved to be optimal or successful. In our particular case, we first started to work with something which is called particle swarm optimization. It was developed in 1995 and these techniques are heavily inspired by swarms or herd. So basically how the birds are searching for food or new location or fishes are searching for the same stuff. So there is some sort of social intelligent behavior. Each individual is reacting to either a closer group of other members or being the leader, let's say, so the generalistic approach. 
So the mathematical model is in its basic form. It's relatively simple. You can see the equation at the bottom of the slide. I'm not going to describe each detail, but basically what happens is you can see on the graph at the bottom, there is like XK, which is sort of initial position in the space of individual. And then the decision making on the next step is based on already known inertia. So basically the speed and direction you are now following. So you have a tendency to go the same way as you cannot to change direction. Then you have some memory from the past. So you can adjust your behavior based on the memory, how far I'm from the previous optima and so on and so on. And then you can communicate with individuals like in our case, directors or cultivators around yourself. So ask them, what's the best condition to reach high productivity? And they will tell you, and you put this information in your decision-making. So these are like sort of three factors we implement in the model. There are different topologies, how you can allow the communication between the members. So this is just for you to know that there is huge variability, how you can adjust the model and it gives you huge freedom for adjusting the model to your particle problem. So this is of course the tricky part. And here we go to the particle scenario. Since we are working now in 40 space, so we have three factors and we have the outcome, which is growth rate. It's quite difficult to visualize it. So it's why I have four graphs. One is really this 4D graph. And then there are projections for cuts like X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z. And here you can see how the initial conditions for real life experiment were chosen. So you need to, in a smart way, distribute the initial conditions of your experiment, of course, and more smart the way you save, of course, the time for the future, because you can easily imagine if you go to extremes, like in this case, we have like temperature 40 degrees and maximum light like 400 degrees of red. But these conditions, I know that they are almost lethal already for the strain. But still, you should go or at least approach the limit to know how the strain will behave. At the same time, we want to apply to mostly to unknown strains. So we don't know what are the limits. So at the first instance, you need to estimate what are the limits of your factors, of your conditions, and then start somewhere. And you, of course, risk that some experiments will basically fail and not continue. You will kill the culture, but that's the part of the business. At the same time, if you work with mobile reactors at the same time, which is quite intensive on the instrumentation, then you get faster results. What we did is the example with six bioreactors. We have in our lab 10 bioreactors, but I don't want to use all of them. So we decided to try it with six bioreactors. On the left side in the graph, you can see how in real life experiment where the initial conditions of the experiment distributed. So each bioreactor got different initial conditions, like different light in blue, different light in red, different temperature. And the graph is actually 4D. So for visual digestion, easy by human brain, I decided to make slices, right? So what you see, these three slices is sort of constant temperature, but there is something going on in the empty space. But for better visualization, I decided not to show it. So you will see basically moving white dots, which is the combination of conditions in the space for each bioreactor. And these white dots will follow or try to search for the optimum. So on the left side, there is initial conditions. You can see how the bioreactors are sort of distributed in the possible space of the combinations of the culturing conditions. And now on the right side, you see the animation, how the algorithm is deciding in distribution of the conditions to each bioreactor using the AI approaches, right? So basically what we can see is that all of them are reaching the optima, which is here at the bottom. In particle, it's something like 38.5 degrees of Celsius, small amount of blue light, like 50 micro instants, and in the red light, if I'm correct, something like 320 micro instants. I will repeat the animation. And what you can see is that basically after 84 hours, it's like three and a half days running the experiment, like 50% of the bioreactors were able to find the solution. And in another like one and a half days, in total like 160 hours, all of them sort of agreed on the final solution. So compares with using surface response design, it was something like 360 hours and doing this like mesh approach, like each combination, a multifactorial design, we spent like almost three years of doing this. So in less than seven days, you can get the results if you are lucky, of course. The disadvantage is that you are not searching all the space. You get only the trajectories of each bioreactor reaching the optima in the fastest way, but you don't know what's happening in different conditions. So we use this as a sort of proxy or first step in exploiting the space of optimal solutions. With this approach, we identify the best solution and then we set typical metrics approach 
and we exploit the space around the optimal space to know how fast, for example, the strain is losing the performance with increasing temperature or increasing light, decreasing light and so on. And based on this, we can adjust or regulate the conditions in real life environment where sometimes it's difficult to maintain it in really sharp point conditions. I have to admit that the algorithms doesn't secure that they will find the solution, right? They can be wrong. So it's usually necessary to run the experiment at least twice. And if for the second time you reach different result, you need to repeat it to get some consensus. We try to do theoretical simulations on this space and basically in 90, whatever, 7% of cases, the real optima was identified. At the same time, if we are talking about optimization for growth rate in this case, it's important to know, especially for real biotech, that growth rate is not everything. If you are interested in more details, I strongly suggest you to read the paper of Ralph Steuer. Most of you probably very well know, but basically considering optimization fitness or the parameter, you need to consider either energy or area you use or whatever other parameter, which is necessary or important for your optimization, not just growth rate. So this is quite a complex problem to decide on. But for the sake of simplicity, growth rate is very much fine. So this all works pretty nice in the lab, but talking about multi-parametric optimization, where you can imagine that including nutrients means like 10, 15 factors easily. And then even six biorectors are probably not enough to make it efficient. The ultimate goal of this research is actually to enable something which we call a distributed optimization. So meaning that you have the biorectors distributed around the world in collaborating laboratories. And then you use our platform to basically distribute the work among these directors around the world, collect the data from them in real time, and in the feedback using the algorithm, distribute the work again, running in different geographical locations, right? And with this, you can get basically, I don't want to say unlimited resources, but easily you can get 20, 30 directors and then breaking the limit of whatever 20, 30 factors for optimization is already realistic. So everyone is actually welcome who have some infrastructure to join because we would like to benchmark this. The problem we are aware of, and most people in experimental biology are trying to avoid this, is to establish sort of inter-laboratory standards, right? Because if I send you our strains and the recipe for media, most likely you get different results in the same setup as we have because there is different water, different chemicals and so on. And this is crucial stuff for success of such approach. But well, that's the challenge, I would say. So sort of summarize, the multifactor design of experiment is one way we are used to approach it, but dealing with more factors very soon reaches combinatorial explosion limits and then you need to apply different methods or approaches. One of them is, of course, AI, and this we proved that could work under some conditions, of course. But at the same time, there is a huge chance that this will be very universal solution. So for whatever biological problems, if properly handled it. The productivity we are always talking about needs to be very well defined in advance. Basically what you are optimizing for, if it is just growth rate or biomass yield or some product yield. Here, I didn't mention that limitation for use of our algorithms is that you need to be able to measure the productivity or your fitness, whatever it is, like productivity of hydrogen, ethylene, whatever. You need to be able to measure it almost in real time. So if it is not possible in real time, then of course, if you take the sample and give the algorithm results in 10 minutes, it's still fine. But I cannot wait another day because then the overall approach will fail. The ultimate goal in distributed optimization is, of course, the challenge, but then that's probably the only way how we can face really complex optimization problems, including all possible combination of relevant factors. Okay, so with this, I would like to thank you for attention and I'm open to questions, suggestions and critics.